Gene Toomer, a Harlem Renaissance writer, I quote the period between 1880 and 1918. The African-American roots of modernism explores how the Jim Crow system triggered significant artistic and intellectual responses from African-American writers, deeply marking the beginning of literary modernism and ultimately notions of American modernity. So when we talk about different elements of this book, for sure something that we're going to have to talk about is racial consciousness. Definitely. I think that's kind of maybe the overall arching theme of the entire book of Cain, right? I don't know if it's a theme. I don't know if it is a motif that he's revolving around, but maybe in the same ways that, you know, Gene Toomer is often heralded as this, you know, writer who he was a passing author, meaning that he was black, but could pass as white. And in terms of who he chose to marry, in terms of who he chose to hang out with, uh, there was a lot of controversy over what is Gene Toomer's identity. And to that point, I think maybe the strongest point for me, this book as a whole, Kane, takes on this idea of a malleable form of identity, where even the passages are vignettes, prose, poems, and sometimes even like this play-like dialogue. It's something that we're going to be moving through throughout this year. So we'll have a playlist down below. We're going to start with just Corintha today, where we're going to go through in depth, kind of summarize what happens in each part, and then discuss uh, perhaps some themes and elements that stuck out to us. Yeah, I, I did want to point out, and you already did that for us, is that I have not read the entire book, the by Tumor Kane, and this story kind of fits, I guess, with the themes of the other few that we have read. I guess that's why I said that, and maybe we'll get into it and realize that it's not maybe a direct theme, that, but it, it definitely feels like it's underlying um, notion that he was trying to get across because I felt like he was writing this book, in my opinion, to maybe find out who he was because he didn't know where in the world he, fo he fit. The book come, came out in 1923. Uh, that was a very tumultuous time period, the Roaring Twenties. People are, you know, blues and jazz and people moving to New York and Chicago. There, there was a lot of things happening uh, in, in the different communities of our country. So I think that he's trying to find his place in that. And I'll be working through the Norton Critical Edition. I'll be reading, uh, the, uh, you know, the little essays here and there as I feel fit. And I'll share some information with them as I go. Like today, there's there's an essay in the back here specifically on just this specific vignette. So let's get started with what happened in this, and then we'll move into our discussion. So in small southern Georgia is Carantha, a young girl who is an absolute siren, sends the men's heads turning in this town. <laughs> And we come across this line that repeats, her skin is like dusk on the eastern horizon. Carantha has always known attention. She's sung loud for other children, even been a little bit naughty to a perspective, but everyone's always noticed her and paid attention to her. And it's when uh, she started coming of age that the town kind of yearned for her to ripen sooner. And the men pray to God for youth and work hard for money with which they showered her. Now, by age 20, Carantha has already married and has a child. She gave birth to the child in a pile of pine needles in the forest, and the men in town all continue to watch her. They bring her money. Men do not know that the soul of her was a growing thing ripened too soon. So there's a lot to this piece, right? It sets up small town Georgia. I think you get a sense for that right away, would you say? Definitely has that old vibey feel to it of that there's a small town. Everybody kind of knows everybody. And I feel that it's kind of a cautionary tale for the people in town that they're going to tell their kids later of don't be a Karentha. You know, that that's going to become like a catchphrase. <laughs> like you don't want to be like her. Uh, that, 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 I don't think that's something that you want to aspire to is something that I feel like comes through this setting up the stage of uh, a good old southern Georgia town in the deep south yeah. in the 1920s. Well, if, particularly if you take on the religious overtones that are kind of happening, <laughs> I don't want to say undertones, they're pretty, they're pretty apparent Over, in the story. Overtones, <laughs> Yeah, sure. but there, there's, there's clearly, to your point, a morality question here. Now, one of the things that, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but Tumor is quoted as saying that it should be accompanied by the humming of a African-American folk song. So even just the way it's written, I'm sure you noticed that it was, it was different 
right? It kept being interjected with this poem-like phrasing and even the way that the sentences flowed in terms of the number of syllables and the number of words in a sentence. It almost reached this like cadence, right? Where you're, you're reaching out for this, this rhythmic experience when you're moving through the story. And that was by intent, Toomer's uh, uh, way of taking kind of like a cultural movement, a, a, an identity question that we were talking about earlier of what does it mean to be African-American? And what does that mean to inject that into art in this case? I did research this a little bit and I, I found the same thing that he said, this is supposed to be, you know, a kind of a cadence to it of one of those folk songs. I read it a second time because it's only a couple of pages long. And I, I intentionally did like, you know, the, uh, what's the little device that, you know, people do with the music. Come on, you're a music guy. Like the tempo, the pacing. I mean, yeah, you... yeah. So I try to do that with my foot. And of course, I have no musical talent whatsoever. But I did feel like I got in kind of that cadence throughout the the, the story where, oh, it, it felt more like a song like this. This should have been sung. And I think it could be very, very beautiful as a, a, a story slash song. Now, Gail Jones does write from this book. One not only reads Toomer, one hears him. His words live beyond the page, full of rhythm and metaphor, sight and sound, lyrical drama. So it's a really beautiful book. But I guess let's start the discussion there on beauty. Where does beauty come from for Carantha? I think it comes from her suitors. I don't think that she has a good identity of her own true worth and beauty. And as we talked about earlier, maybe this is Toomer trying to come in you know, a realization of his own self. That's how I took it. I also think that we do, as people, a lot of times identify our own worth and our own beauty by how others judge us and look upon us. You get confidence when other people give you compliments. And even in the story, it's hard for her, I think, to take those compliments because she's just, she's so inundated with them. She doesn't know if they're genuine or not. Because once she has this child, I almost felt like because of the pacing of the story, they did you feel like it, it slowed down that they weren't giving you as many compliments because her beauty has kind of run its course? I thought that I, I thought there were elements of they talked about her skin a lot, right? Like why, why talk about skin unless we're supposed to ask a question about about it, right? And then say lines such as her skin is like dust on the eastern horizon. Oh, can't you see it? Oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like dusk on the eastern horizon when the sun goes down. So why bring so much attention to skin? Let me ask this question to you. What ethnicity did you picture Carantha? I, I picture her as mixed, a very light-skinned woman, a, a dark light-skinned woman, dark light-skinned woman, I don't know. Is that because of Gene Toomer, the author? I think so, some, yes. But I also uh -huh. felt like it was that almost golden hue um, all, because they do. But then, then it threw me through a loop because there is the quote that uh, they say that she resembles November cotton flowers. So kind of confusing, right? I, I think that he's, he's messing with us. I don't think you're supposed to know. I think beauty is supposed to not be defined. I think it's undefinable. If, if, if something is truly beautiful, does it really matter? I wonder, we read that story by Toni Morrison, Resistative, which had the, where they never defined the race of the characters, but they gave you racial stereotypes, right? And in this one, we have a lot of references to, you know, her being like a black bird, which I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be a racial card or anything like that. But there were allusions to her being as, you know, perfect as dusk. Or That Evening Sun Go Down, which is an Afro-American song, a, you know, a work song that was sung. So there were a lot of those uh, cultural songs that were put into it that uh, I wonder if this is putting in just enough information to allow a reader to fill in their own prejudices and expectations on this character. And I wonder if that's the, the point of view from which Toomer wrote, perhaps, sometimes. And he's been praised as trying to criticize both sides because he was passing. And again, I know we're talking a lot about him more so than the story, but I think that's important to know your author and that he, he was praised and criticized by both races of trying to almost antagonize um, both sides of, of the race of the white and black culture. And that 
uh, he wanted them to criticize and both be able to come away saying, no, 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 Karintha is, is ours. She's my, she looks like me. And then the other side is like, no, 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 no. She looks like us. And I think that, that it does a good job of that because you don't know where to go. I think that e both interpretations are equally valid. Why do you think you said earlier that you thought the compliment slowed down after she had the child, which, you know, sometimes when you have a child, uh, there's talks about the the aging, the loss of beauty or the changing of a body shape from when you had not had children. You said you felt like the compliments had slowed down, but I think didn't at that point they still brought her money and they still sang the songs in a sense. Like, tell me more about why you thought that that would have changed her beauty. It wasn't the story itself. It was, again, my second read through when I'm kind of doing the, the tempo of the story. And mm -hmm. maybe it's just in my mind, I felt like the tempo of the story changed about halfway through when she has the child. But also the, 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 the writing style changed as well, where you don't get the repetitive nature as much. And everything, the, 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 the sentence structure itself, and even the compliments and the way they describe mm. her becomes very shortened. To where before oh. it's more long and flowing and beautiful. And it becomes more, um, not stark, but it, it becomes very um, abrupt towards the end of the story, I felt like. And then on that, at the end, you're kind of left wondering with that question of how she's fizzling out almost, I feel like, is that she has, she's blossomed too soon, that this shouldn't have happened to her. Um, well, there was that quote, men do not know that the soul of her was a growing thing ripened too soon. So it's not that she ripened too soon. It was her soul, right? What does that mean? when her soul has ripened too soon to these people in, in the South, per se. I think that they're, what she did maybe in their eyes in a very religious Southern time of our history is sinning. That, that, that's something that was not really mentioned directly, but with all those overtones of religion throughout here, you can't, you can't deny that these people probably look down upon her. Yes, she's beautiful. She sought after about the men, but they don't talk anything about how the women viewed this lady, how they treated her. Was she ostracized? How w w was she welcome in the, you know, the women's circles, in the knitting circles? Uh, you know, she, is she living alone? We, we don't have any idea about the husband. Uh, she has the baby by herself out in the woods on pine needles. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of, you know, missing continuity in this story. All it is is that we know she's beautiful from the men's perspective, and then they give her a lot of attention because she's that, I don't want to say loud mouth, but we all know that one person that is always thriving for attention in the group. Well, what did Carintha want? Like, why did she want attention? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we never really get to see inside of her head, do we? We don't, yeah, we don't have any we don't have any motivation from her of why she was the way that she was. It was just she was a firecracker and had a lot of energy. And some people are, I think, just born that way. Now, one of the essays in the Norton version, it talks about uh, the musical elements of it, like call and response, right? Where one music will make almost kind of like a statement. And then you have the instrument, the orchestra, the band respond to that. It's almost like there's like a conversation. And the critics, I guess, kind of compare uh, Carintha to the town, how she's making a call, a push into the town uh, about her her ripening, her her sexuality, and the town's responding, right, in terms of uh, giving her attention, in terms of giving her money, uh, whatever that may mean. And I think it can kind of be compared to that, but I guess what's interesting is that Gene Toomer never gives her that agency of why the call's being made. And it's almost just kind of like she's looking for something but never really gets it, at least from what the town gives her. Very similar to what we kind of saw in his other story, Becky, right? Where Becky never got a voice. Corintha never gets really a voice of her own as well. It's always through see, it's always seen through the eyes of the town. And are they completely trustworthy? Or are they just infatuated with her? You know, and we're seeing this young young girl grow into a young woman and and beyond her years at twenty. It's a very, very sad story. Yeah. When the sun goes down, goes down. And that is very reminiscent of the work song that we were talking about earlier. I don't know what happens when the sun goes down, but it is typically violence. It is typically not good. It's not uh, the birth. It's the destruction of the day. So uh, ultimately, I feel like it kind of ends up with maybe some of these ominous tones of uh, maybe slowing down to your point that maybe she is having her life slow down uh, with the day almost. As we said in the beginning, we're going to be moving through the book Kane by Gene Toomer. Below, you'll find the playlist with all our other videos. I'm Crypto. Peace.
My name's Una. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Peace out.